Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all. As you may know, since 2018, a group of civil society organizations has been committed to prepare the 30th anniversary of the International Year of the Family 2024. In this regard, we're enriching a civil society declaration that is developing, following the four megatrends that the United Nations Department of Economic Affairs has suggested. And on this occasion, the megatrend in turn was urbanization and international migration with a special focus on urbanization and families. We expect this focus group to enrich the civil society declaration with substantial contributions from various perspectives shared by experts around the globe. Thanks, thank you very much to all of you for your participation and interest in this project. And I also wanna thank the civil society representatives and other stakeholders following this meeting via YouTube and Kumbermeit for his work in the preparation and future work around it. We have agreed and sent in advance a questionnaire made of nine questions. This middle will consist of the replies from each expert to each question and will be expected not to exceed more than two minutes. All other participants are welcome to attend in an observer capacity only. The transcription of the meeting will be used to produce a publication and include final recommendations based on the points participants will have raised. The final outcome will contribute to adjusting and enhancing the recommendations of the Civil Society Declaration on the occasion of the 2030, the 2024 anniversary of the International Year of the Family. All the participants will be properly quoted and the documentation will be used for our advocacy work under the terms of Creative Commons Public License. This means our publication will be not used for commercial use in any case. And now with any further delay, I will give the floor to each expert in alphabetical order, starting with the following question. And let me first also introduce to the experts right now. So we have here uh, Gabriela Mitzis from Greece. He's the director of social administration research laboratory of the University of West Attica. We have also Antonio Francina, head of communications office of the Benito region. Then we are have, we're, we're having Ignacio Socias uh, representing the Inclusive Cities for Sustainable Families project on behalf of um, Wilson Levy, the director of the postgraduate program on smart cities and sustainable cities from the Uninova University. We also have uh, Michal Michalski from Poland, professor of the Department of Economic Ethics and director and of the Institute for Family and Society Studies Foundation at the University of Adam Milchips in Poznan. And we have Sita Mokomane, Associate Professor at the University of Pretoria in Demography and Health and Society. He holds a PhD on both from the Australian National University and has extensive research, policy and programmatic expertise in the field of family studies, with a specific interest in work family interface, social policy analysis, and social protection. Now I'll start with the first question. How can urban families be at the center of social integration strategies to face demographic challenges? And I'll give the floor to Professor Amitsis. Uh, greetings uh, to everyone. Uh, thank you again for this uh, kind invitation. Uh, the topic that you have chosen to discuss is uh, a very sensitive issue, uh, at least for the European agenda. So my focus will be on Europe. So uh, let me start with uh, addressing the first uh, question. Uh, first of all, uh, European families living in uh, urban areas, they face strong socioeconomic challenges linked uh, particularly to three different risks, unemployment, poverty, and of course, social exclusion. Uh, these challenges create serious risks for the prosperity and resilience of the whole European society, not just for, for families and their members, if uh, connected uh, with other uh, more serious risks related to low fertility, aging, uh, and of course, 
the critical issue of uh, pension payment and the adequacy. In this respect, uh, urban families should be at the center of interrelated public policies. So I focus on the role of public policies that uh, may affect four different or even five different situations. The employment situation of uh, all working families with children through industrial relations policies, including minimum wages, a, a critical issue nowadays discussing between the European Commission and the member states. Uh, the coverage of specific social risks for all working families with children through the so-called social insurance policy, including uh, sickness, benefits and pensions. Uh, the third situation, the financial situation of all families, particularly those with children, through family policies uh, designed at the national level, but implemented more or less at uh, regional and uh, local settlements. Uh, fourth, decision of individuals to become parents. I think this is of great uh, social political value in Europe, the decision of individuals to become parents. What is the key term, the key policy here? Demographic policies. And of course, uh, don't forget large families. Here we have different situation. We have in Europe to improve the decision of parents to create and support large families through population policies. Uh, what about to, population? I may, to, I may have to leave the rest of your answer to the to the end or for the other answers. Yes, yes. What about yeah. population policies? So I, I will close with that. Uh, it should be defined as a set of measures taken by national governments and supported by regional or local authorities to modify the way a national population is changing, either by promoting large families or uh, increase uh, legal residency in this specific territory. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. First, Francina, you have the floor. Thank you very much indeed, first of all. I agree with uh, Professor Amitsis, but uh, I would like to underline the cultural problem, because there is not only an economic problem, but also a cultural problem in, the, in this field. Uh, of course, there is the lack of family policies, the lack of housing policies, for example, and services for the for the family. This is a problem in Europe. The problem is quite different in South America and in Asia or Africa, where, the, uh, where we have to deal with other kind of uh, aspects of the uh, population, demography. In Europe, the decline of population, from my point of view, is the result of a society who don't believe in the family. This is the problem. Uh, we have to choose between uh, uh, consumer, for example, and family. In Italy, we can say that in the Italian constitution, is written that the family is very important, but we don't have any real policies for the family. And this is the gist of the problem, I'd say, in Europe. It's a cultural problem. Of course, as uh, Professor Amitsi said, uh, there are a lot of economic uh, aspects, but they are the result uh, of the lack of cultural approach to the problem of the family. So I give you the floor. Thank you, Mr. Francina. And now I'm gonna give the floor to uh, back to uh, Ignacio, please. 
Okay. So good morning again from New York. And I think that social integration, from what we have learned in this project, has three very clear requirements. First, education. You can't be socially integrated if education doesn't work well. And we have some examples, I'm thinking in Brazil, for instance, where the lack of quality of public education is a real problem that impedes, that makes for young people many times impossible to get socially integrated. So helping families to be good educators as parents, as grandparents, as siblings, and also by having a good educational system, I think it's very, very important. Second, um, to be free to choose. Families have to make choices all the time. And quite often, they feel they can't be free because of their economic situation, professional situation, etc. We have, for instance, this example of France, where during the past decades, families have been able to choose, for instance, the number of children they want, the configuration of their families. And this brings me to the third and last point. When you are free to choose, you feel responsible for your choices. And then you can be accountable for them. So this responsibility, this accountability that should come after education and freedom, I think it's another very important point. Because if, if not, we, for instance, with subsidies, we see we get people solving the present situation for today, but not knowing what they can choose for the future and not making them accountable for that. Thank you. Thank you, Ignacio. Uh, Professor Michalski, you have the floor. Hello to everybody. Greetings from Poland. Um, it's a pleasure for me to be here. Um, when it comes to this question, I would like to start from the, maybe like two, um, into, well, two, two things that I think uh, address the problem. Um, first is, in my opinion, and uh, on the basis of, of what I have um, found in the, well, in the course of my uh, research work and, and literature, I think the uh, first thing is that family is the basic uh, social integration um, uh, group, institution which means that um, to a large extent, uh, what happens in the family uh, means that uh, the, the, the final product of the family functioning is that it produces, it, or it should produce the individuals who are ready to join the larger structures, macro structures of the society, which means that, that uh, let's say if the family uh, is missing, well, we have the social integration problem, which means that, um, it, why am I saying this? It makes the family, I would say, as a natural and, and basic building block for social integration in the community. Yes, because the, let's say the, 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 the neighborhood consists mostly of families, in fact, yes? And families, each family on, on its own, like they, on a daily basis uh, makes the social integration. So this is, uh, I think, uh, fundamental to understand the, the role of the family. Uh, so this is one thing. Um, second thing, because uh, cities and uh, towns are different, yes? I wonder if um, some interesting recommendation would not be that, that we would recommend or I would recommend uh, uh, forming so-called family councils 
uh, in each city. This is the example of the Poznan we, uh, that I work and live in. And we have uh, one of the first family councils at the governor's office um, for the whole region. But, but at the same time, there, was, there is functioning the, um, uh, the something similar uh, at the president of the, of the city, which means that uh, this group, this council mostly consists of people from NGOs, of course, from family NGOs. And this is the council which uh, knows the situation locally and is able to advise, to give advices on some real issues, real needs, real problems in this given, in this given uh, community, in this given uh, city, let's say. And this is my, I think, uh, it, it could be useful because uh, some, sometimes some of the, I would say, uh, tailor, not tailor-made, but some universal solutions may not work in all the cities. But I think this, this fa so-called family council could be a useful tool for um, evaluating the situation in the city and, and uh, uh, being a kind of like a pool for ideas. Or Thank you, Professor Michalski. Okay. Yep. So this is my Thank you. Thank you. Now, before giving the floor to Professor Makomani, I'm uh, uh, just going to welcome uh, Renata Karsmaska. She's the focal point in the family for the U whole UN system, and she has just joined. So, Professor Makomani, you have the floor. Okay. Thank you, Alex. Um, and greetings all from Pretoria in South Africa. I'm going to talk uh, address this question and all the others from my experience of. Africa, where I am from and where I am based. But in terms of this um, first question, I want to just say that I think urban areas have unique demographic challenges such as low fertility rates, high proportion of migrant populations, and more youthful age structures as young people move to urban areas and search for job and educational opportunities. But I think we, we need to recognize that these challenges differ between urban areas within countries and between countries. Mining towns, for example, will have high proportions of young migrant men and their challenges will differ, for example, with um, an urban area in a border town where, at least in Africa, these are, have high proportions of migrant families and young women who work as cross-border traders. So I think social integration strategies must really be context specific in addressing these demographic challenges and recognize that this differ from those of families in rural areas. Previous speakers have talked about job creation, housing, education, and I agree with that, but the education needs of someone in an urban area really differs from the, someone in, an, in a rural area and the job requirements as well. Housing, just the urban planning should differ. So that's my contribution to this. Thing and it has to be context specific. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Makomani. Now I'm gonna just turn to the second question. What are the best ways to address systemic po poverty and inequality in urban settlements? So again, I'm gonna start with Professor Amitsis. Please, you have the floor. Um, <clears throat> taking into account uh, the comment by Mr. Ignacio Socias, I think uh, we should uh, be always careful with uh, the use of terms, particularly when we are using complex terms, uh, not defined by uh, international organizations, like uh, social integration or poverty. It's very critical to, to have a consensus on the use of these terms. Uh, taking into account that uh, in your uh, questions, uh, you use uh, both uh, definitions, but without defining social integration and, and poverty, uh, I would uh, recommend the following. When uh, we are referring to social integration, we may include uh, access to key services and rights, including health, education, and housing. When you use the term poverty, uh, we may uh, distinguish between economic aspects of hardship or difficulty. So uh, my recommendation in the second question uh, about addressing systemic poverty and inequality are the following. 
The first is, of course, the development of active employment policies, including adequate minimum wages. I think this is a, a commonly accepted uh, framework, uh, not only in Europe, uh, across the globe. Uh, the second is uh, development of policies and programs to combat both extreme and re relative income poverty of families. Uh, third recommendation, policies and programs uh, that uh, need to address family risks related to children costs, particularly through family benefits or family grants. But uh, they should not be focused only on uh, extreme poor families, but also on middle income families. And my last question, which is uh, very critical for countries like the USA and Canada, uh, we have not to forget tax credits and advantages for families with children. So uh, I summarize uh, employment, access to income, uh, addressing family risks, and of course tax credits and advantages. So here are my recommendations for poverty. Uh, as you may understand, I uh, have chosen a different path uh, related to, to social integration. It's uh, rather different for me, integration related to poverty. Thank you, Professor Mitzi. Now I turn to Mr. Francina. Okay, thank you. From uh, my point of view, we must avoid ghettos in the towns. Uh, that is, uh, to avoid uh, neighbors uh, with height concentrated of poverty and guarantee services, schools, uh, meeting places, uh, places where the, the people can play any kind of sports, for example, but also cultural spaces in the um, in the neighbors, uh, in the in the in the districts. Uh, of the town with high connections with the city centers to peripheral districts. Uh, the, the new towns must be connected and we must avoid high concentration of poverty. This is a, a, a great problem because a high concentration of poverty means also high tensions and social tensions. We have to create a new idea of town. A town where people can exchange experiences. Not only, not, not the town with the districts of poverty and the rich or medium classes and so on. No, we have to mix together to guarantee social spaces spaces for the sports, for the education, cultural spaces, for uh, everything. This is uh, my point of view about uh, the inequality in the urban settlements. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Francina, Ignacio, please have the floor. Thank you, uh, Alex, and thank you very much for your comments, Professor Amitsis, because I think they help us to sort of move on and get a uh, uh, a more global concept. In my position today, and as I am replacing basically uh, Wilson Levy from Brazil, who had this health problem at last minute, I want to refer now, I will talk about social integration later, to thinking in South America and in Brazil specifically, in this problem of many people going from the rural areas to the cities and not, not, not finding a way to really overcome poverty there. And I think that has a lot to do, and that will be my main suggestion, to linking the labor market needs to education opportunities for these people who migrate within the same country from the rural areas to the cities. I, we have known already in Sao Paulo where our project is or in Mojidas Cruces 
or in Curitiba, some initiatives to do this, and they have been very, very effective. We should probably consider also the problem we can find of inequality, of access of women to this education opportunities. As you know, in Brazil, as in other South American countries, there is this problem of the number of single mothers that can't really have, we could say, a full family because the father is absent, and at the same time, get the possibility to get out of poverty through adjusting to the labor market better. That will be my reply. Thank you. Thank you, Ignacio. Uh, Professor Michalski, please. Thank you very much. So when it comes to strengthening, uh, no, uh, addressing poverty and inequality in urban settlements, um, first things that I would recommend, and I think that is the, maybe in some places of the world, the hardest uh, or the most difficult recommendation that could be um, uh, communicated is strengthen, strengthening family ties, which means that strengthening marriage and uh, making um, the stable um, and let's say intact family um, uh, target, yes? Because on the basis of the research that we have from different places of the world, we see that uh, the marriage uh, and the stable family is the best remedy for poverty yes um and this is this is the the the, the fact from the research so so uh this is the thing that i think uh, should be somehow addressed even though i know that in some places it's it's not really popular to communicate this uh today but uh ignacio mentioned single motherhood yes single motherhood um is the is the issue that is connected with, for example, is, is uh, connected with, with uh, uh, the situation, how the marriage is, is uh, also culturally, not also legally, but culturally respected and let's say um, secured. Um, and this is in, in the long run, the best also uh, situation for the human capital in terms of children development, um, human capital production. When it comes to inequality, uh, I would only mention this, what was mentioned in the last point, um, this access to, to housing and services. I would also put stress on it that, that this access to, to different services like sports services, uh, uh, different free time uh, um, opportunities uh, is also, in my opinion, important. Thank, Thank you. you, Professor Mikowski. I give the floor to Professor Mokomani, please. Thank you very much, Alex. And coming last, some, most of my points have been taken, but something additional I would like to say is that maybe we, to address the poverty and inequality, also go beyond conceptualizing them as income poverty and um, income uh, inequality. And I like some of the points that came, and I agree with them that as much as I agree in developing strategies for quality job creation, look at things like creating urban areas that uh, um, recognize and provide spaces for cultural spaces, education, and so on. Other improving access to health services. And I think uh, housing is a very big issue that I agree and can also lead to social integration and social cohesion. Only one's home provides real stability and security. And for many people in low income household, just having a house really gives hope. And I think that can, we look at poverty and inequality as multidimensional and address those cultural, social aspects. We can really address the systematic um, poverty and inequality in our urban settlements. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Makamani. Now we're going to the next question. How can help reach smaller businesses, informal workers, and at risk sectors to overcome the crisis while promoting the transition to greener, more equitable urban economies? Professor Amitsi, you have the floor. 
thank you again for the floor. Uh, for me, the, the key option here is the so-called uh, local sustainable growth policies, uh, often stated in, in Europe or in the uh, United Nations vocabulary as sustainable development uh, at the local or regional level. Wh what is this option? Uh, this is, of course, economic development. Uh, we have not to forget the key role of markets in producing wealth across the globe uh, that will attempt to satisfy the need uh, of human needs, not only profit-making objectives, but in a manner that will sustain national resources and, of course, the broader protection of uh, our environment for our future generations, including our children. Uh, how will sustainable economic growth will be achieved if there will be a consensus? And uh, we saw the negotiations last week about uh, climate resilience across the globe. Uh, if we deliver a, a political and policy commitment, uh, particularly at the regional and local level, that uh, will manage all available resources. So here I include families. It's a very powerful, I agree with all of you, it's a very powerful social resource, family, in a manner that uh, families will not be depleted, but uh, will remain as, let's say, the most important social fabric for future generations. That means sustainable growth that will only focus on a company profit-making objectives probably will create more risks in the future than expected. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Mixis. Now I'll give the floor to Mr. Francina, please. Thank you. <laughs> we can speak a lot about this, <laughs> this answer, no? but uh, I try to synthesize. Uh, first of all, support the credit. We have to support the credits for the smaller uh, enterprises and uh, the credits, the banker credits. Uh, support professional training and long life learning. This is very important. Uh, to overcome the crisis. We have to look at the future, but looking at the future means to, uh, to give the right training for the businessmen, business people and workers. Also, tax policies, which are very important, tax policies. We can, we can develop a new society, a new world, without changing the idea, as uh, Amit says, uh, said, uh, the idea of uh, a, an economy based only on the uh, gains. We have to share the gains. This, this is, we have to change our idea. So I come back to education, long life education. New technologies, the development of new technologies to support the credit banks for the poorest people and the smaller uh, enterprises and uh, a new policy about taxes. Stop. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Francina. I'm just gonna give the floor to Ignacio now. Yes, I think as Antonio was saying, this is a very broad topic because we are talking about different subjects here. Smaller businesses, informal workers, at-risk sectors. I think we shouldn't forget that there is a global trend against all of them. And that will be there. That, that, that won't go away. And small businesses have to compete with much bigger multinational companies that are very well organized and that can reach the customers even easier than if 
those closer businesses around. Also, informal workers, I don't think, well, nearly any informal worker is informal because they want to. Usually, is because they haven't found the way to become regular, to become formal. And, and third, also, the, 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 the at-risk sectors, I think, after the pandemic, are nearly all of them or many of them. So we should consider that we are talking about a situation in which it's not easy to go against this global trend and even less after the pandemic that has left many people with debts in a weaker situation. And then we had promoting the transition to greener, and more equitable urban economies. So of course, this, this um, environmental factor is also very important. So I think we need to redefine many things. We need to devote a lot of time to find solutions with imagination, with, with great effort. I don't think we are ready for this yet. So my advice will be encouraging experts, and we have some here, but also other experts, to really think about it and to give new creative ideas that can actually help. Thank you, Professor Michalski, you have the floor. Thank you. Um... Before I will answer the question, I must say what I have uh, talked to Ignacio a few days ago. Uh, I'm personally uh, fascinated with, with um, the fame, I, I don't know it's, if the book is famous, by Ernst Fried Schumacher, The Small is Beautiful. So we are talking about, the, in this question, uh, we talk about small things which are fragile, yes, more fragile. And I think this makes, um, uh, I would give two answers. Uh, first uh, answer is I would just uh, uh, mostly uh, also agree with Professor Francina, what he said about this different economic and also educational, professional training and so on, possibilities for, uh, for those uh, smaller, for example, smaller businesses or people uh, working informally. Um, as a chance to to com compete or enter this this uh, competition, and second, I would also think that there is some necessary necessary as I gave this recommendation for family council, uh, maybe some kind of uh, sustainability council in the city, working with the city uh, city authorities which also deals with this issue how to um, make this whole uh, let's say uh, economic mix for the city yes which means that that um, in different situations uh, with different kinds of uh, economic entities for example large companies are sometimes quite often they're useful and so on and so on but in in some situations in some aspects they uh, they well they somehow in the long run, they uh, somehow, for example, uh, erase the identity of the place, yes? So for example, let's imagine the city where you have only like fast food restaurants, yes? So, and there are no some like uh, local cuisine uh, places. So I think that maybe some kind of, um, again, council which would give some recommendations on the basic of this specific situation in the city could be of, of use uh, of, some possibility to, to, to do something. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Michalski. We turn to you, Professor Mokomane. Okay, thank you very much. I think we all agree that uh, participation in urban economies is very competitive and this came very clear during the crisis. I know at least in South Africa and I know worldwide where most uh, small businesses were really kicked out or shut down by a bigger one. So I think we should take that into consideration and try to support them through various um, 
I mean, someone talked about competitive or, or enabling tax rates and thing. I also agree that maybe competitive rates for services for small businesses, like what happened here was many small businesses had to close because you pay the same rent wherever you are doing with a multinational company really can com compete. So really take into consideration the needs of that. And I think some certain aspects of urban economies could be reserved for small businesses, simple things like um, sale of perishable goods. I know in some African countries, there will be a market where small business are supposed to go, but they're usually in the wrong side of town, if I can say, and very few, not really, but if we improve that also, this can also lead to greener and more sustainable uh, economies. So basically I agree with everyone, but I also think we have to make special arrangements for, to ensure that small businesses are sustainable and supported. Thank you. Thank you, Professor McCormany. And it's true, I mean, this is really fostering a lot of engagement among the youth the private sector and definitely the climate action. Um, now I turn to the next question. What is the main impact of urbanization on intergenerational relations regarding care and mental health? We start with you again, Professor Mitis. Okay, uh, let me first uh, focus on uh, the selection of target groups uh, affected by uh, urbanization. Uh, I have defined three different target groups. First of all, children. Second, uh, people with a disability, including, of course, children. And the last uh, and uh, most powerful, given that uh, they have uh, always in national and local settings, also a very strong uh, behavioral uh, electorate uh, impact, uh, elderly people. All of these three categories uh, face strong challenges uh, regarding the availability of uh, care and mental health services, uh, especially those who live in uh, urban areas with non available public service are uh, de facto excluded. Uh, despite the, the strong role of families and unpaid carers in the provision of services, I'm afraid that uh, relevant needs uh, are not able anymore to address by families themselves, particularly when families address uh, social deprivation and income poverty problems. So they are not good carers, particularly in Europe. So my recommendation, we have to rediscuss again the introduction of the human rights approach in health and social care services, where the role of the market will be limited. Let's think again about the role of the state as providers of health and social care services. Uh, in this respect, uh, I think that uh, heavy investment across the globe is needed in a, a very often neglected area, which I would define as access to early childhood education and care before compulsory education. This is my strong recommendation a, a very much politically debated area, early childhood education and care, particularly for those children living in neglected urban areas without availability of a good care public services. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, turn to Mr. Francino. Yes, uh, <clears throat> it's not easy to give an answer, but uh, in working class uh, and in poor uh, districts and neighbors, uh, problems add to problems. We have some problems with the young generation, with the elderly, with disabilities, and we have to rethink the structure of the, our neighbors, our towns. We have to create new spaces uh, of sociality uh, and care also. 
spaces where uh, young people can live with elderly people. This is a, a problem. I think of uh, about some uh, some experiences we have in Veneto, for example, with uh, social housing where young live with elderly people, with people with disabilities, with new families, with uh, children. This uh, experiment uh, works very well when there, there, there are the right rooms, the right space to live together. And for that reason, I say that we have to rethink the idea of town, to give in the town the right services for the families, for the people, but also the right room. In our, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking about Italy, but it's not, uh, I, I don't think that in other towns in Europe is different, the problem is different. We have much, uh, we have too much space for the automob uh, for the autos, for the connection, transports. We don't have places for uh, sports or live together. We need parks, for example where the people can stay together. And this is from the main, po main point, one of the points we have to, to rethink the idea and the structure of the town. Thank you, Mr. Francina. Ignacio, you have the floor. If we talk about intergenerational issues, I think we should always start by considering that aging population is something that we have there and we will have every day more, especially in third world countries, in developing countries, because it is already there in, in, the, in the rest of the world. So in that sense, I would suggest first, anything that can help the third age not to become the end of life can be very helpful because we know now that we have many people in their 60s, 70s, even 80s who can be very active, who can provide a lot of experience in many ways, who are probably, they don't need, they don't have as many economic needs as others and they can be really useful. In that sense, I want to mention here that I've always been impressed by some of the initiatives they have at, at the Benito region to, yeah, to take advantage of these people who can help and want to help. Second uh, idea as a consequence, the role of grandparents in the family. This is something quite new because before grandparents were often too old and also because parents now are busy and they need the help of grandparents. So how can we develop systems that really allow them to do it? Um, I'm thinking now, for instance, in this uh, family policy in Qatar, by which um, when a couple gets married, they have the right to find a house as close as possible to their parents, so to the grandparents. Okay. And third, um, I think we should also consider talking about mental health, that we know from we have learned during the pandemic that the most affected haven't been the eldest. At the beginning, it seemed that the eldest who were alone, who probably couldn't contact the, their children, their grandchildren. But then there are already several studies published that show that the most affected in their mental health have been the, the 
young girls, teenagers, or young in their 20s. So I think this has to uh, can tell us a lot about how we are, what we are doing with our young people and how much they can learn from those who have lived much longer and maybe have experienced difficulties and have learned how to deal with them. Thank you, Ignacio. Professor Michalski, you have the floor. Thank you very much. I am not, uh, when it comes to these results, I am uh, a bit not uh, surprised when, if, because I know that children are the most affected by the pandemic. I think that uh, most of the elders, or I don't know, maybe all of them remember uh, harder times. Some of them remember war. Some of them remember war and the younger generation, I think, especially of quite often raised in very comfortable uh, conditions, at least in, 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 in some, some, some Western countries. So um, um, when it comes to this intergenerational relations, I think that uh, it's not a mystery that, uh, that, that, that the city life and urbanization like uh, weakens this intergenerational ties, uh, sometimes because simply young, young people uh, migrate to the city to study, to they start a family and, and the grandparents are outside the city and, and in Poland, for example, it's pretty. It's not. It's not a, a studied topic, but um, I think there's a lot of there's a great. Um, I think I'm pretty sure that the uh, grandparents are are pretty important uh, fertility factor. When the help and support of grandparents is 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 accessible, yes, it's easier for the parents to have kids. So this is just a comment. And, and the one thing that, that cities uh, certainly weaken and, and um, even I would say sometimes destroy intergenerational relations, um, care and mental health. Uh, there are studies which show that the, the city, well, uh, the statistics show that unfortunately the cities uh, are the places where it, becoming mentally ill is more probable. So there's greater uh, chance for uh, becoming uh, mentally ill when you live in the city. So, so this is not, uh, I think this is not unique to some area. And certainly um, uh, this has to be taken into account. Um, once again, I think that it's more, much, uh, much, much more difficult to, um, to let's say, uh, Take care of the intergenerational family uh, relationships and and even um, to 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 like develop a good and uh, stable and healthy relationships when you are um, when you live in the city because I think also the city lifestyle seems to be more more you are more often in a hurry yes more more haste lifestyle um, so. For, of course, this is not the, the, the full uh, explanation, but I think that that uh, certainly urbanization makes our families, because in the end we have families, makes families, family life, family life more challenging, and I would say more uh, difficult and uh, more stressful. Uh, of you. course, in a statistical way. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Mihalski. Professor Makomani, you have the floor. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, at least in developing countries, but I think in most parts of the world as well, urbanization is driven by high levels of uh, um, migration from rural to urban areas. But increasingly also we see a lot of regional migration. In South Africa, for example, there are high proportions of people who have migrated from neighboring countries like Zimbabwe, Lesotho and Malawi and so on. And uh, usually these are young people in the working age groups and they typically leave their extended families, mother, parents who are grandparents to their children back home. And obviously this has, as a result, has uh, weakened intergenerational relations over, over time. The traditional support for caregiving responsibilities for domestic work is not there. So a lot of people are migrants and they don't have that intergenerational support or even just relationships. So uh, people in urban areas like everyone has said are more likely to face high levels of work family conflict 
basically because they can't cope where they are and also with the worry of who's caring for for all especially elderly parents in the in the in the place of origin so there's compelling evidence that is emerging and that has even been before the before the pandemic that showed the negative impacts of this on uh, mental health of urban residents uh, we see a high levels of stress, depression, and anxiety, especially about, among women who are the major caregivers. So that's a, an issue that the question said the impact of urbanization on thing. I think that's, that's the major impact. Thank you, Professor Makamani. Um, before turning to the next question, I just want to remind you to thank you because till now it's been pretty good to stick to the two minutes, not only because we want Mr. Francina to reach to the end, but also because it makes more efficient and easier for the rapporteur. Also, if we state our policy recommendations for each question. So I turn to the next question up now. How should urban morphologies be reconfigured to enhance their resilience and make them more sustainable and productive through inclusive planning? Professor Amitsu, you have the floor. Uh, thank you again. This is a, a very critical topic. In the University of uh, West Africa, we have uh, developed a new concept uh, heavily influenced by the discussion that takes place uh, since the 80s within the European Union. We may call it the local active inclusion uh, ecosystem. What is that ecosystem? It's a, a multi-pillar approach of regional and local authorities. So we don't include only cities, but also regions in this discourse with a very specific aim, not only to combat, but also to prevent, don't forget the magic term prevention, uh, poverty, social inclusion, and uh, other social risks connected particularly with market failure uh, through a, a concerted set of three different pillars, access to cash benefits, active employment measures, and of course, uh, access to basic services, including education, health care, healthy nutrition, uh, and housing. Uh, how we have uh, decided to, to promote, to, to, to make a, a real term of this discourse through the so-called uh, active inclusion policies at the local level that uh, should uh, facilitate not only the integration into the labor market of those people who can actually work, and this is very important because unemployment is uh, the most serious cause of poverty across the globe. It's unemployment, not other social risks, uh, but also measures that will provide support for social participation or social integration, according to the definition that we may use, for those people who cannot enter the labor market. Don't forget this specific part of the population, including children, people with a disability, single parent families, carers, and of course, uh, elderly people, and particularly those without any public entitlement to a pension. So my recommendation is the local active inclusion ecosystem based on this specific uh, policy and political guidelines. Thank you, Professor Mitzi. Mr. Francina, you have the floor. So, as I said, in our towns, we have much more rooms, much more space for the cars instead of for the people. We have to regain the idea of living, not living in a hurry, but we have to live with a uh, another time. We don't know how technologies can help social inclusion in the town of the future, but we know 
that we have to change our way of living. Ignacio said a very important thing first. The international trend with the great multinational societies, companies, uh, this trend is going to destroy our social uh, way of living and to destroy our idea of towns. We have to rewrite the idea of towns as a social space and put in this new idea the family as a center of the community. We have to choose between the interests of the great companies of the of the good for the of the families and the people to play to to play down to uh, plan an, a new idea of town based on the family not based on the cars and the interest of the great companies thank you mr francino uh, ignacio you have the floor antonio just mentioned something which I found very interesting, which is living in a hurry. And I can say that this is the situation in many South American cities I have visited. For those who have a job, so for those who can be considered you know, successful, public transportation systems are very bad, not to talk about Africa, for instance. So we make people devote a lot of time commuting, as they say here. And that is a problem. Why? Because that time is time they don't give to care, to their families, to something we all need. You know, that there was that some years ago, there was this insistence in the concept of poverty of time. But I think it's true. If you if you have money but you don't have time, then there is this lack of affection of the affection we all we all need. And this is not only happening in in developing countries. I was astonished to learn, for instance, that in Paris, they have built this new city of the justice for thousands of people working there, and they didn't thought while it was being built in how people will get there. So now it's very complicated for them because there are no public transportation accessible lines, not enough parking places, etc. So I think this is, um, if we want families to really be able to fulfill their role and to reach the well-being they deserve, we need to design uh, smaller cities inside the big city so that they don't need to travel long distances on a daily basis. Thank you, Ignacio. Professor Michalski? Thank you. Uh, I'm thinking uh, when it comes to this designing uh see this as a good places to live because i think that's what's the idea so i i also agree with professor franzina that um this um let's say the heart of the city maybe it's it, it may sound uh, a bit romantic but the, the family is the heart of the city which means that when we think about the city development we rather think that the city will develop uh, in an organic evolutionary way yes so for example we will not be flooded by by thousands of uh, like migrants from rural areas in a week yes we rather think that of course the city will grow because that's that's normal rather normal uh, way of uh, that things go but it will grow organically and the best organic growth is the growth based on the family, because that's the way the family grows. Yes. So uh, it means that if we did this, the, uh, if we uh, uh, 
think about such growth, uh, we should, as a city, concentrate on a family. And it, for example, and in terms of designing the city and making these planning decisions, it, for example, may mean that we can transfer the idea that sometimes is discussed on this uh, state level, that we have, for example, this triple test, yes, that before we uh, make uh, some, some decision uh, or some new legal act, we uh, ask ourselves what impact will it have on economy, what impact will it have on eco um, uh, nature, and what impact that will it have on so society. So in this terms, maybe it also implementing this kind of triple test for the cities, city design and city planning could be useful that each decision should be like also uh, tested in 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 the in this dimension of how will it influence family living and people thinking about uh, may, uh, building a family in this city or or that so that's my uh, opinion okay. thank you professor Mihalski, thank you uh, i'll give the floor now to professor mokomani Okay, I agree that in terms of uh, demographic, in understand, we need to understand urban centers in terms of the demographic needs of individuals and families when we do our urban planning so that it's inclusive. In South Africa, for example, Pretoria and Johannesburg, which are more developed, uh, beautiful road networks, but it doesn't matter whether you live five minutes away from work, you need to drive. Why? Because you can't walk, you can't cycle, because there are just basically no spaces for that. And you can see that uh, if you want sustainable and more green environments, those are things that you should consider. When Ignacio was talking about what happens in Paris, is the same thing. Between Johannesburg and Pretoria is a major commuting area. And there's a fast train that goes to Johannesburg between the two cities every day. But you have to drive, most people have to drive to the station 30 minutes, then take them. So really, you might as well just drive to Johannesburg because you can see that the inflation didn't look at that. And it does impact families in a way because the two, three hours that you spend on the traffic, if it was more efficient and then you could be at home with family and children. And so. so I agree with everyone, maybe really, when we are planning for inclusive, make it more inclusive and where the family lands in our planning, basically. Thank you. Thank you, Professor McCormani. I'm actually happy that many topics that are really keen to or partners for these preparations are, have been uh, commented like the ECD, early childhood development, that is a priority for many of us. And we've been seeing studies from the Doha International Family Institute. Also, the intergenerational relations, that is also another topic for inclusive social development of, of DESA and, and care that has been through the, this whole question that I know that is really keen for Haro and Ferba that are part of this partnership. So now I turn to the next question. How can flexible and innovative institutional and financial frameworks be developed through a more integrated, cooperative, multi-level governance in a post-COVID era? Professor Mitzis, you have the floor. Thank you again. Uh, for me, the, the care idea uh, in this uh, particular question is uh, the use of a multi-level governance processes. It's very critical across the globe. Uh, what is my recommendation for this uh, discussion today? Uh, contrary to uh, the use of economic development or even sustainable growth, national strategies, action plans, or pacts, there is no broad discussion today, not only in Europe, uh, through the continent, about the development of national family pacts. What would be an ideal definition of this pact? It would be a, an agreement between the national government, the regional and local authorities, that uh, will sign up a, a political uh, declaration in the form of a pact, committed to coordinate and synchronize their policy agendas, 
in order to focus their action and financial resources, not only in the economic on financial development area, but also for promoting family driver goals and targets. This is something that is missing. Uh, what will be the advantage of a national family pact? And I think that the International Federation for Family Development will be uh, seriously discuss this opportunity. It uh, should allow all political forces in a given national settlement draft and implement family policies in partnership and of course monitor their progress to this end a pact should aim at setting national and possibly regional or local targets with resources when necessary as a top of national government resources define indicators and targets other than just increasing the GDP, uh, implementing uh, flagship initiatives about families and particularly with families with children, and of course, identify obstacles and barriers to the achievements of the targets, both at national and regional local level. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Zemitsi. That was pretty well structured. Um, Mr. Francino? Uh, <clears throat> there is uh, an old motto, think globally and act uh, locally. Mm -hmm. And this is the key, one key, an opportunity. Subsidiarity is the key of the future. Uh, we, family, community, towns, regions, must have the right uh, uh, tools to rule over their reality. You, we are speaking about uh, financial frameworks. Who controls the finance? Nowadays, there are rating agencies that can uh, sanction the success of the failure of the state but who are the rating agencies who are these great this group who can manage our future and change our future from this point i say that financials flows must be brought back under public control This is another key. So the first, think globally, share experience as we are doing together, but act locally and bring back to the public the financial flows. We, can, uh, we can't live with uh, banks, uh, rating agencies, few rich people who rule over the world. One percent of the richness of the world you know, is shared between the majority of the population and one percent of the population has the main part of the richness of our, of our world. Is it possible to live in this way? I ask you, it's impossible. We have to change this situation. We saw in Glasgow, for example, what was the main problem in Glasgow, COP26? They were unable to give an answer. Who can pay for the transition? Who can pay for the poor countries? And we were not able to give an answer. We have, as I said, to bring back to the public, uh, the financial flows, the richness. Thank you, Mr. Rentino. Um, Ignacio, you have the floor. Okay, thank you very much. 
I've written down the suggestion of Professor Amitsis, and I'm sure that at IFFD, the National Federation for Family Development, we will be able to discuss about this because I think it's really very interesting. Also, everything that Antonio has said is very interesting and, and I do agree a lot. So on the top of that, I wanted also to mention our experience with regional and local governments through the Venice Declaration. Um, we have realized that when we work with national governments, member states of the UN, it is sometimes very difficult for them to really be down to earth and to understand what's going on in the different parts of their countries. That's why we turn to local governments because we realize that they are much more aware of what's going on. And also, of course, there are different situations in different parts. And also our main finding I wanted to share is that regional governments have been a great help. For instance, not only, of course, the Benito region <laughs> present here, but recently we had, for instance, this uh, Kujawsko-Pomorskie region in Poland, discussing and voting in the regional parliament, the Venice Declaration, to see how it could be applied to the 19 main cities. And then organizing a meeting with the mayors and coordinating, which I think it's a very important uh, verb to use here, what they're going to do. We had the same yesterday in the regional parliament of Querétaro in Mexico, for instance. The, they were discussing about this and next week I will be in Mexico also for some other regional parliaments. So my, my, my suggestion will be, let's try local governments to coordinate better with regional governments or and national governments, it depends on the size of the country, so that there can be really a coordinated action, because we know that most of the times political interests, uh, etc., I'm not going to get into that, uh, come first, and and then they they don't really they are not able to really make this coordination. Thank you, Ignacio. Give the floor now to Professor Mihalski. Yeah. Thank you. Thank uh, you. When it comes to the part of this financial framework, so it's not my, I would not, uh, probably I'm not uh, able to say anything um, interesting or, or uh, in, innovative, innovative. But when it comes to this institutional uh, frameworks, I, I would give the example for, uh, for some possible interaction um, that we have in Poland uh, it's it's not in fact uh, some something implemented already but there is the idea that that uh, for example when it comes to the family policy the of course some stra demographic strategy and all the uh, like general uh, tools are developed and designed uh, on this uh, on this macro level so and this should go. There's, this is the idea that that there is uh, the um, post of in every um, governor's of the region office. There is the the, the design is that there will be uh, a so-called um, the representative of the families of the governor, and he will be a kind of like uh, interface would uh, try to um, translate the macro solutions into, into this um, local, local level of uh, how in this special uh, area, this, this family policies, this family um, tools could be implemented and could be effective. 
and then he he also it's very good if he has the the support of the family council in this on the level that he's and of course he this council and, and this this representative is also uh, oriented towards uh, putting the ideas and implementing the ideas down to the all the local local um, 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 how to say local communities so so this is all i can like add to this um and probably it's not nothing more that i have uh, really like um prepared and and ready to to, to present thank you appreciate professor Michalski. professor makoman please okay i also don't have much on this but i just wanted to say yesterday i was in another conference on social protection and one of the points that came up was how COVID has shown us the importance of being adaptive and, and flexible so i think it's also relevant here that in the post-covid era we make sure that institutional and financial frameworks are flexible are and able to adapt to unforeseen shocks I also agree with the recommendation to share experiences because if we are in this together, I think in terms of multi-level governance, maybe share experiences because our a final goal is the same. So if I could, if I worked with a framework that has been successful, it would be for the benefit of all and all families to to. to Oh, sorry. So that would be my short contribution to this. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Magomani. And actually, I, I, I'm happy that we also mentioned the, the need of commitment uh, to help and uh, in many ways the distribution of wealth because all others, other partners that are part of this kind of partnership are ELFAC and, and NOE, who are like in associations and confederations in Europe that host the, the will and, and needs of many large families and they're really aware of that. Now I turn to the last question uh, before we can kind of open the floor for any issue or challenge that you may have. And this is also in, in many ways uh, calling for the next mega trends that we've been exploring or we're gonna explore. So the question says, how can, I, how can local authorities reduce the risks posed to families due to climate change and demographic challenges? Professor Amitis, please, you have the floor. Thank you again. Uh, I believe that this is the most locally driven questions of our discussion today, a, a territorial based question, the role of local authorities. So I, I include both regions and municipalities. Uh, a, a very useful distinction. So, uh, what local authorities uh, could do? First, uh, they should identify and understand the risks. But uh, here we are facing two, two great constraints. First, uh, at least across Europe, regions and municipalities do not have legal competencies and financial means to address problems related to climate change or demography. This is competencies of national governments, which have uh, both a uh, political and financial power to deal with environment and, and demography. Uh, second constraint, maybe more important, Regions and municipalities do not have technical expertise to address complex issues related to, to climate change and demography. Uh, what is my recommendation? Uh, interested uh, local and regional authorities, if they are capable to, to understand and highlight these risks, these risks they should invest on uh, formulating uh, the so-called uh, local family development action plans. What uh, is this concept? These are uh, action plans designed and ratified 
by the political bodies of local and regional authorities. The national government uh, is not interfering here. And uh, as far as their context is concerned, they should, in principle, address multidimensional family poverty, climate poverty, migration issues. We have to include a migration and asylum seeking as a key risk, uh, at least for uh, the discussion in Europe. And last but not least, regeneration of places with low fertility rates and small number of families with children, the so-called uh, family-friendly uh, regional planning. Uh, my last recommendation, if political elites could uh, decide to invest on these action plans. They should also monitor and evaluate their implementation. Uh, monitoring and evaluation is always a very critical factor. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, something that may be of importance for you, uh, last week, uh, my university submitted directly to the biggest uh, regional authority of Greece, the region of Attica, where our capital uh, Athens is located, a proposal together with the Greek Association of Large Families about the development of this uh, family development action plan that could be supported by a relevant observatory a family-friendly observatory that uh, could uh, address problems uh, linked particularly to the uh, lack of uh, technical uh, expertise uh, at uh, the center of uh, regional or local authorities. So my recommendation here is that first political elites should understand, then they should re respond through investing uh, with the use of family development action plans. Thirdly, they should monitor and evaluate. And lastly, they should include uh, the civil society uh, family groups in the monitoring and evaluation through the establishment of these observatories. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Mitis. And, and then congratulations for that observatory. I, I'm, I'm sure there's going to be key to progress on family policies. Now I turn to Mr. Francina, who's really aware of these challenges, not only because he represents a local and regional authority, but also because he lives in, in this city that is challenged by climate change and demographic challenges. Yes, as you know, as you said, I am working and I'm speaking from Venice. Please, 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 a tribute to the change, to climate change. So I can give you some, some small suggestions, but uh, I think that they're important. It is true that the climate change and the demographic challenges are in, in, in inter, international issues. So we need an international frame. But uh, at the local level, we can work for example, organize civil protection services and care services, use technologies to inform citizens and create and spread a culture of safety. For example, in this town, in Venice, when there is the high water, in the phone, you can write SMS, a message from the administration, Pay attention, at this hour, you can risk working in the town. No, this is a form of technologies that can be useful, informing the people about a risk, or also informing the people where they can, where they can go, where they can find services. But as uh, Ignacio, so Chias said at the very beginning of this meeting, education is another key word, because if we can inform the inform inform the public opinion 
about a lot of problems. As you see, for, for example, for the earthquake in Japan, they can fight the, the earthquake because they are, they have a culture about earthquake. And we have to gain to, to we have to, we need a new culture about the climate change. And of course, a new culture about the demographic problem. And uh, education, as Ignacio said at the very beginning, is the key for education and, of course, new technologies. With the new technologies, the local authorities can work, can give a service to their citizens. I'm sorry, but I have to, to leave because I have another meeting. So thank you very much. And uh, I beg your pardon for my terrible English. And so I hope to see you uh, again as soon as possible. Thank you, Mr. Frentino. Thank you for making time for us. I mean, just complicated. I know that maybe you have even high water today. So take care. Thank you. I'll thank talk you. to Ignacio now. Yes. Well, we need to acknowledge that in most cases, uh, local authorities, as Professor Mitzis was saying, have no competences to make decisions. But maybe their role is more sending information and contributing to help the, the national government. Because there are many things that are happening all the time, new things that national governments should know about. For instance, we have now as a consequence, partly of climate change, energy poverty. So how, how are families addressing these in different parts of the world? Or we also were, we're now facing this lack of resources, which somehow are a consequence also of the demographic challenges. And for instance, in, in Spain, they, they're talking a lot about the future of pensions, uh, precisely as a consequence of the well, of the low fertility rate. So I think local authorities that, as I was saying before, are closer to citizens, have this role to send information. And for this, I have a very specific suggestion that I've seen in quite a few cities, similar to the observatory, but it's just to establish a family council. So some representatives of families that can be in regular contact with local authorities and make sure that they get the right information about what's going on regarding these topics. Thank you, Ignacio. Professor Michalski, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, so I think that this, this question uh, deals with this uh, issue of of the contribution of the families to the development of the city or local community, which is pretty often uh, under ignored or underestimated. I would give the example of some, some for example, waste management uh, uh, fees, uh, payments in different local um, governments in Poland where in some places, the large families um, are respected, and in some places, well, the and the, cal the the scientific calculations, in fact, which show that uh, in case of waste management, the large families do not uh, mathematically uh, produce as much waste more as many people uh, live in the family. So there are different calculations. We have also some some available. Uh, so I think that in this terms, in terms of this question, I would uh, look at it as an issue uh, that the families should be uh, protected against injustice. Because in some cases, I think that, that um, for example, uh, families 
quite often shown as a biggest like threat to, to nature and the biggest source of pollution and so on and so on. And at the same time, the whole issue of human capital production, which I mentioned, um, like uh, social protection, social safety, social, um, I would say, um, uh, how to call it, um, the way that family, for example, balances the different risks, uh, economic risks, for example, is, is neglected and, and not respected. So I think that, that in terms of these risks, uh, first step is to look to have a like objective uh, and um, um, based on real data um, outlook on how much families contribute to the situation. And how much, uh, how much more they contribute to the functioning of our community, and then uh, the discussion about how uh, different groups or different uh, inhabitants should be treated is should be like uh, started. Of course, there is this issue uh, because I know that this question also deals with this, uh, for example, uh, topics of of um, growing costs of energy. Yes, in Poland, there are some like uh, discussions and plans. How can we help uh, families and, and in people in general, uh, like uh, uh, be able to, 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 to deal with this growing uh, costs of, of energy, uh, for example. So of course, these are these issues, but, but I would, uh, as I said, I would start from this, this justice perspective of the contribution that family makes to the uh, to the community. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Mijalski. Now we turn to Professor Mokomani. Okay, thank you. I'm speaking from an extremely hot Pretoria, like really, you feel like you're in an oven. And yesterday the temperature is about 42 degrees Celsius. In the evening we had this massive thunderstorm. It was welcome because it cooled, but in the morning, all trees were falling down and things like that. And I'm saying this because uh, the government has also said, and we are regularly getting periodic regular power cuts and in some areas, water restrictions. And the government has warned that this might be the case for the, in the next five years. And I'm saying this because this shows some of the risk of posed by climate change. And I, at least in Africa, I think we really have no choice but to steer away from non-renewable energy sources. It doesn't make sense, at least for me, that in Africa, where we only have two months of winter, basically, the rest of the year is hot and thing, we still depend on coal and thing, if it could go. The solar system use gray water systems and, and so on. And I think like the last speaker say, maybe support families to adapt to this, these issues. People could do it, but what we have talked about, poverty, inequality, lack of income security, very few people can afford that. And what do people do go back to firewood, coal, and then it's a it's a it's a it's a vicious circle. So to answer the question, how can local authorities reduce the risk, support families with uh, uh, to adapt to, to more uh, and to get away from non-renewable energy resources. Thank you. Thank oh, you. And then just finally, in terms of demographic challenges, I'll just say, mm -hmm. let's wear the demographic dividend lens. I think we've talked about it, ensure quality education and health services, job creation and good governance. I think that's a very important issue too. Mm -hmm. To address that. Thank you. Thank you, Professor McCormick. And now um, I turn to the last question that is kind of pretty open. If you have any other issue or challenge that you want to raise, please um, feel free to say it. Uh, I turn first to Professor Amitis. Okay. Uh, if we could summarize what uh, issues or challenges. Uh, were discussed today. I could uh, few poverty, demography, and climate change. Okay. And we also uh, paid attention of public or semi-public policies to address these challenges or issues. I would uh, contribute to the question about issues or challenges, uh, adding uh, 
to new areas of very uh, both policy and uh, political concern. The first is migration and tax asylum. Uh, given that this is uh, a highly politically polarized uh, debate, I could just uh, tell you that 50% uh, of third country uh, nationals having families inside the European Union area are at serious risk of poverty last year. What does it mean? that uh, migration uh, is not particularly during the COVID-19 uh, crisis, is not linked to financial prosperity for migrants, but with increased risks of poverty and social inclusion. That means uh, the majority of third country national with families in European Union uh, are not able to satisfy living standards and uh, probably there will be very strong regional variation particularly in countries like Italy and Greece with high rates of migrants and asylum seekers. The second issue perhaps most challenging uh, from a financial perspective uh, housing affordability and uh, deprivation closely linked to, to energy poverty and energy stability risks. Uh, why is that important? Because uh, families, and particularly families with more children, faced in increased risks nowadays to guarantee an adequate housing. What an adequate housing means? It's a house that meets uh, accepted national technical standards, is uh, in a re reasonable state of repair, uh, provides a reasonable degree of thermal comfort, and is available and accessible at an affordable cost for, for parents and their children. So my recommendation is do not forget migration and asylum, and do not forget housing affordability and housing deprivation as a key challenges for the prosperity of families. Thank you. Perfect, Professor Mitzis. Ignacio, you have the floor. Yes, just wanted to add some information because maybe you have asked yourselves why we chose these particular questions and not others. Well, most of them are inspired uh, on the topics of the next World Urban Forum, which as I just uh, copied in the, in the chat box, will be held next June in Poland, precisely. And, um, and I think it is a great occasion, as much as we can do it, to make sure that families are included in the conclusions because the risk is to forget about families when we talk about development and we talk about public policies and then to suffer the consequences of not having them on board. So that's why I, well, I encourage all of you, of course, uh, to, to be part of this in, the way you possibly can, or maybe also to help us to be present there with your with your contributions. And I think this is an, a general idea we should consider when we talk about cities. What is the role of families and why they should be considered, why they should be listened, etc. Well, I take also this opportunity to thank you very much for being here today. Thank you. Thank you, Ignacio. Um, Professor Michalski, you have the floor now, since I think you've been, you've been mentioned in <laughs> Poland. Yes, yes. Well, Katowice is, is a place I've been to. Um, so the issues that I would also uh, add to the catalog that we have discussed uh, is 
These are, there are two things. Um, one of them is uh, the challenge that I see living in a, well, uh, in fact, for five years already, I've been living outside of the city and the, the rest of my uh, formal life, uh, I've been living in a city. So um, having family, I know that uh, from the perspective of having family, I see the difference, for example, uh, as and that's what I want to talk about is that uh, I mean the cultural and uh, media climate uh, uh, that we, you have in the big cities. I mean all the all the advertisements, the billboards, and so on, which which uh, automatically when you have a family and you go with kids, your kids see everything. Yes. And I think this also makes a difference because, um, uh, of course, uh, uh, to simplify, you can say that when you live outside of the city, you don't have uh, as, ma as many occasions for your kids to see the things that probably are not pro-family in general. Yeah. So I think it makes a difference. It makes, um, I think... Um, because we talk here about the, whether in terms of family, uh, we could ask the question, is it better to raise your kids in the city or is it better to raise your kids in the rural areas, for example, yes? Of course, in, in, in terms of different places of the world, the rural areas means something different. So this is, uh, this is uh, obvious. But, but what I mean is the, the issue that probably could be somehow touched is whether uh, sustainable cities should not be also uh, taking uh, paying attention to to the pro-family climate in terms of this whole whole uh, area of other advertisements um, uh, which I mentioned. So this is one thing. And second thing that comes to me is maybe some um, useful um, method for for. Uh, Developing the sustainable city identity, I would call it that way, would be the idea that I know that functions in Poland and in many European countries, and I think I think it's also in different places of the world. I mean, the the city partnerships, which uh, probably uh, I'm not sure most of the people from Europe know, which means that there are some some mutual. Uh, two-part uh, long-term partnerships between different cities, uh, which mean that cities are in a contact and they, for example, can exchange some good practices. And uh, because most often, for example, the situation is that, that, the, that the partnerships are, um, are made between the cities from different countries, which, but cities which are in some, in some terms uh, uh, similar to each other. Yes, for example, my city, Poznan, has a partnership with Hanover in Germany. There, are, for many reasons, these cities are similar. So it may be, in terms of looking for some, uh, let's say, sustainable solutions for the city, this kind of uh, cooperation, long-term cooperation, may be useful uh, in looking and, and developing uh, such solutions, uh, also in terms of um, family family policies. So this is the second and last of my um, um, things I wanted to mention. And thank you once again for invitation. And it's been a very, very interesting and, and, and very good time. And also in terms that I have learned a lot. So uh, greetings to you all and thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Mihalski. And um, well, last, I turn to Professor Mokomani. I, I love that she has an African perspective and, and is pretty valuable to me. Okay, thank you very much. For me, another issue or challenge, I'll just say definitely mental health. I think we've talked about that and uh, the pandemic has shown us that and I, at least from the, it might be different, different in other parts, but at least from the African perspective, like I was saying, the basics of dealing with mental health issues is usually things like simple like exercise and like I was saying in Pretoria and Johannesburg in most African countries you can't even take a walk without risking being hit by a car or, or anything you'll have a whole suburb or a whole segment without a park so if you have children to where do you go to so I think in the 
especially in the post-COVID area, we really should think about that and other issues just in terms, apart from the structural uh, planning of cities, things that have also come up like, and that affect families. And I think anxiety, someone said once it's, it's going to be the second, I mean, not anxiety, mental health issues are going to be a second epidemic after this. And I think our city should take that into consideration in planning. It's things that sometimes we forget, but they really, and especially when we, like what we are talking, where urban residents are usually isolated, no intergenerational relations and can be feel isolated and lonely. We need that kind of support. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Mogamane. And, and well, now we have reached the, the end of the focus group and I really thank you all for, for all your contributions. Also your presence here in YouTube and, and, and definitely soon. Um, I appreciate that Renata is, is here participating closely to these preparations and we know each other very well since I was not here yet, but we, they were also preparing with some other partners or the same ones that the other preparations for the 2014. And I would just like to add that um, I really thank you for keeping the, the time and we have accomplished this in less than two hours actually. So I really have, thank you for all your time and your contributions and I hope that we can have them pretty quick. Uh, and for this, we have the Kun here present following the discussion. I see, I see Renata's. I'm going to give the word. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you, Alex. Um, uh, hello, to Gita, my good friend. I'm so glad to see you here. Uh, I would like to thank you, first of all, to, for organizing this group. And secondly, for all your input and really interesting remarks. And uh, I, I think we don't listen very well. Can you hear Renata? I, I can't. I, I just very distant. Yeah, it's very faint. Maybe I have to adjust this audio settings here. Okay, I did it maximum now. Is it better? Now it's yeah. now it's better. Oh, okay. Yeah. So thank you once again for having this meeting, organizing this group. Um, and this is very useful for our preparations um, for the IY, uh, IYF plus 30. Um, I just wanted to say that um, I was really, uh, I appreciated especially the, um, the focus of designing cities on infrastructure to be um, family friendly, what Zita said, what Mr. Franzini said, many of you. It's really to make cities more livable for families so I think this is also the focus of the of the um, uh, sustainable development goal 11. So thinking about um, uh, green spaces for families to interact for all generations to be able to, um, you know, live a decent life in, in the cities. Um, and I am very grateful for the sustainable the, su sustainable aspects of what you said about the cities, because this is really like the, the SDG 11 really talks a lot about sustainability in the cities also. Um, so thank you for all this. So uh, just to say that this topic will be continue will be continue continue to be discussed in next year. This is our focus topic plus migration for next year. So I hope to um, follow up on the findings of the group and have other meetings and maybe for others to join. And um, and just to say that we will reflect your conclusions in the report of the Secretary General that will be pre prepared for next year. Um, so I'm very grateful for all your contributions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Renata. And now I have to end this before it's two hours, so we can keep it with, within two hours. And thank you so much for all. I don't know if somebody else wants to say some words. If not, we keep in contact. And thank you for all.